Let's jump into the word for this morning. I'm titling this message, Celebrating Freedom. Do you like my red, white, and blue? Celebrating freedom. And I know, I know, I didn't get my calendar wrong. I know next week is July 3rd and then it's 4th of July. And, uh, but already in the stores, you have the red, white, and blue decorations all over the place. And, um, you know, fireworks is going to be expensive this year because everything is expensive. So we'll enjoy watching other people burn their money. <laughs> right? And um, I love, I love celebrating the 4th of July in this country. You see, I've had to make huge, tremendous sacrifices to be a part of this country. Unlike you who was born over here, majority of you. I've had to renounce... Someone laughed in the back over there. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Samuel, is that you? No. Um, I've had to renounce my, um, the place where I was born in India, renounce my citizenship, and take an oath to say, this is going to be my land. This is going to be my home. This is going to be my country now. And when push comes to shove, I'm going to respect and represent this country. Um, although I have the Indian accent, I still look Indian. I have the head nod. I have a U.S. passport. And um, I've now become an American citizen. And every year when we celebrate the 4th of July and we celebrate the freedom that we have in this country, I celebrate it with a very different emphasis than most other people do. Because I've had to, you know, I have something to compare it to. I have a place that I used to call home that I get to compare it to. Uh, when I come to church, I have a, a church that I get to compare it to. When we celebrate freedoms in this country, I have a country to compare it to to see the beautiful value that we have here in this country. However, next week when we celebrate the 4th of July, we're going to see a country that's divided. People who are going to really be able to rejoice in the freedoms that we have and recognizing the people that fought for the values that you and I celebrate. And on the other hand, especially after what happened this last week, we're going to have people who are frustrated and are going to feel like they've lost their freedom. It's in this context, church, I want to talk to you about celebrating freedom. And please don't get me wrong, this is not a political message. What I'm doing is merely using our country as an illustration for what we see in the book of John chapter 10. There's a celebration in John chapter 10. And the celebration is interrupted by Jesus. And I want you to know, Jesus will always interrupt your celebration. Because true joy does not come in the red, white, and blue. True joy does not come in the saffron, white, and green. That's India. True joy does not come because the stock market has gone up or there's a right president in the White House. True joy comes from Jesus and he will always interrupt your celebration. He will always interrupt what you're rejoicing and he confronts you with, do you know what you're celebrating? And that's what we see in John chapter 10. And I think it's a very timely message for us because while I saw the news of Christians posting all over social media about the, the, the laws that have been changed, you know what? While I celebrate that babies are going to have a chance to live, I also mourn for those who were... No, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Christians. I mourn for the women that have been growing up for 50 years under the lie that freedom is murdering a baby. And church, you know what? That's your fault and mine. Pastors, it's our fault for telling them that that is truth. Now, I know you didn't go tell people that that's the truth. But you know what? They are 16 years old, 17 years old. And they think that the country is infringing on their freedom. And they wonder, how can I celebrate freedom when the country is taken away? And you Christians are such bigots. And you are infringing on my freedom. So I want to talk to you Christians who are excited about this. Praise God. I want to confront you on your celebration. On the other hand, those of you who feel like the church is infringing on your freedom, I want to confront you on this freedom that you believe that you've lost. And I know I'm going to be hated on both sides, but you know what? I want to preach God's word unashamed this morning because Jesus will always confront what you're celebrating. So buckle up. It's going to be a good one. John chapter 10, verse 22. At that time, the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem, and it was winter. The feast of dedication, I told you, Jesus is going to interrupt every celebration. And the feast of dedication is not a, a biblical feast. It's not one of those things that you find in the Old Testament of like the Passover, the tabernacles, the feast of trumpets. This is a different one. This is the intertestament celebration, okay? Um, this is a celebration where they are celebrating the dedication of the temple, what we today call Hanukkah. In fact, Hanuk 
in Hebrew means dedication. When it says train a child in the way that he should go, pretty much says Hanuk. Dedicate the child in the way that he should grow. When he's old, he will not depart from it. What are they dedicated to when they celebrate the Feast of Dedication? You see, it was a time um, in Israel's history when the Syrians, they were ruling over, they'd taken over, and they were really mean, extremely mean to the people of Israel. Um, there was a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes, who I don't want to mention his name, because uh, it still makes me angry at what he did to the people of Israel and what he did to the temple. What he tried to do was he tried to Hellenize the Jews. What he tried to do was try to make the Jews more Greek. He tried to make their philosophies, their thoughts, their food, their worship. He forced them to worship Zeus. And we still see the same problem in the church today, man. We're very Hellenized. We want to be such intellectual people when we're supposed to be storytellers. Anyways, that's a whole different rant on that. But this guy enters in and he does the weirdest and the craziest thing possible. He goes into the holies of holies and he sacrifices a pig on the altar. And as if that wasn't enough, while mothers brought their babies, eight days old, to be circumcised, he would not only kill the baby. I'm sorry if this is a little too gruesome for you, but you need to know this. Because I want you to understand the extent of the celebration that's being interrupted by Jesus' very presence. This guy would kill the baby that was brought in for circumcision, tie the baby around the mother's neck, and then brutally murder the mother while the dead baby is hanging off her neck, either by pushing her off a tall building or a cliff, or even at times crucifying her with the baby hanging around her neck. That was what was happening in the temple, and along shows up a guy named Yehuda Maccabees, Yud Judah Maccabees, Judah the Hammer. That's what his name means. His nickname was the Hammer Maccabees, and you can read this in the non-canonical writing of the Maccabees, the history of this, um, it's actually very fascinating, the historical account of what happens. This guy begins to fight a three-year war against them. He raises up an army, and he whoops them, man. I mean, that's like, it's got to be celebration. It's like, yes, kick them out. And he made sacrifices, restored the altar, restored the temple. But there was a problem. There was no oil for the menorah to burn in the temple. They only had oil for one day. And by faith, they lit the lamp. And the menorah stayed lit for eight long days. It was a miracle. And in this season, they saw a man that God raised up, like Moses, to bring back and to restore the worship of God. They saw not only a man that fought for them, Judah Maccabees, they also saw the provision of God through the oil. And they were excited that they got to worship. But about 200 years had passed by, and now they're being ruled by the Romans. And instead of Judah Maccabees, we see Jesus, the Messiah, in Jerusalem. And while they're celebrating the Feast of Dedication, the Feast of Hanukkah, Jesus is interrupting them. And this was their question. Look at this. The question in verse 23. As Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnades of Solomon, so we saw it was winter. By the way, it's... Um, It'll be somewhere around November and December, so you know it's winter. And they're walking in the temple, in, in the colonies of Solomon. When the first temple was destroyed, there was only one wall that was left from Solomon's temple, and so they called it the, the colony of Solomon. If you remember the book of Acts, the early church met in Solomon's colonnade. Anyways, that's a lot of details for you. And verse 24 says, so the Jews, now once again, sorry, pause over there. In the book of John, when you see Jews, it's not talking about the general population. It's specifically talking about the religious leaders. The bad shepherds, the thieves and robbers that we spoke about last week, okay? So these religious leaders gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, if you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Isn't it funny? Beautiful celebration, remembering what God had saved them from, restored their worship. They are leaving the celebration and they're surrounding Jesus because I told you, no matter what you're celebrating today, no matter what you're grieving today, the very existence of Jesus will interrupt your celebration or your sorrow. <laughs> I love this, man. The very existence of Jesus will interrupt you. He interrupts the woman who came to fetch water. He will interrupt you along the way. He'll interrupt you when you're clapping your hand and rejoicing. He'll interrupt you when you're getting ready to post a great praise report. He'll interrupt you when you're ready to sit there sorrowful like Elijah under a broom tree. He will interrupt you. And... 
they ask him this question. Tell us plainly, man. Stop keeping us in suspense. If you are the Christ. And what I want to unpack this morning in the next 20-something verses in John chapter 10 is Jesus' response to them. And in essence, what he's going to do, he's going to confront them and he's going to confront you and me on what are you dedicated to? It's good for us to celebrate things that seem morally right. But folks, if you're not dedicated to Jesus, what you celebrate, it's not doing any good. What are you dedicated to? Secondly, do you recognize this consecration that is Jesus' anointing? And thirdly, we're going to see the true source of celebration. Okay, We see it comes from Jesus, but the way it's applied to us and through us is only through our salvation. So I want to talk to you about dedication, consecration, and salvation. So get a cup of coffee if you have to, because I'm going to dive into this. I think this is a very timely message. It's time for Christians to wake up, to actually start thinking, for us to actually start reasoning through why do we rejoice in what we rejoice because it's very easy for us to go with the flow and rejoice in something that really does not have any deep-rooted convictions and a rejoicing is meaningless dedication consecration and salvation god's been uh my friend asked me this morning how are you doing and you know what man i've been able to rejoice in in trying times this month because of what God's been walking me through about my dedication, consecration, and my salvation. So you ready? Number one, who or what are you dedicated to? What is it that you are dedicated to? It's important for us to have people dedicated to abolishing slavery, to abolishing laws that harm the innocent, it's extremely important for us to have people who are dedicated to taking care of the poor. It's very important for us to have people who are dedicated to caring for those who have nothing. Yes, it is. But the American church has lost its focus. I can say this because I come from a third world country and I've seen American missionaries in India. We've lost our focus on the gospel. We've lost our focus on the main thing. We've lost our focus on Jesus him being the cornerstone and the church being built on the prophets and the apostles and the teachers and Jesus himself being the cornerstone. We've spent all our time doing our good works. Let me give you an example for this. The book of Joshua, we see that Joshua says, uh, Joshua chapter 24 verse 15, I think it is. He says, I do not know who you want to serve. If you want to serve the gods of the Amorites, go ahead. If you want to serve the God of the Moabites, go ahead. But as for me and my household, we will now, Joshua's job was not to be a pastor. Joshua's job was to go fight wars. We sang a song, walking around these walls, I thought by now they will fall. He was called to be a warrior. But yet, his primary responsibility was to be dedicated and devoted to serving the Lord. American church, how often we get distracted with politics, with the laws. And that's exactly what the enemy wants you to do. No wonder this nation is divided. No wonder people who vote differently from you don't feel comfortable coming into your church. What kind of a gospel is this that we preach? But there is no love. There is no grace. There's no invitation. Come on, man. That feels like a, like, like a contradiction to the Jesus that I see in the Bible. Because the Jesus in the Bible loved hanging out with prostitutes. And prostitutes loved hanging out with him. It's the religious folks that hated him. What are you dedicated to? American Christians, if you're dedicated to politics and not to Jesus, you got it wrong. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That comes first. That's my primary responsibility. Please don't think I'm sold out to the liberal world. I'm not. I firmly believe in certain things that I will not budge on. But primary, first and foremost, my main alliance is to Jesus and the gospel. Jesus says... The Bible says that true religion is taking care of the widows and the poor and caring for the orphans, which is true. But if you're not doing it out of love for Jesus, but as something that we do because we have a program, what you have is not pure religion. What you have is empty religion. And you're dedicated to churchianity. You're dedicated to your religion. And religion will take you to hell, man. Religion is what crucified Jesus. Pardon me if I'm a little 
animated and excited about this because I've been waiting 12 years to preach a message like this, and finally I get to. So, yes, yes, praise God. Because I believe that there are those who know Jesus but do not know how to share his love to the lost. And instead of loving the lost, we're beating them up. And it breaks my heart, man, because it breaks his heart. Because I was one of them that didn't dress like Christians, that didn't talk like Christians, but was one person that God used that caught me in the world of sin and loved me into the kingdom with truth, without it being washed down. But at the same time, showed me the love of Jesus and didn't beat me with the religious you know, doctrine or standard or rules and regulation. Just brought me to Jesus and Jesus took care of cleaning me up. John chapter 10, verse 24. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, so when they says that he gathered around him, in the book of Psalms, it talks about Jesus, or it's prophesying about Jesus on the cross. They surround me like a pack of dogs. That's what's happening. They're not like, you know, like, hey, Joel, so I have a question. No, no, no. They are surrounding him. They're like a pack of hyenas. Okay, I want you to picture this. Now, it's the time of the feast of celebration, of dedication, rejoicing. God had brought such miraculous victory for them, but they're leaving that and they're coming after this one guy named Jesus who's a carpenter's son hanging out with fishermen and they're surrounding him. And they said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Now, Christos, Mashiach, Christos, Greek, Mashiach, Hebrew, both mean the one and the same thing, the anointed one. If you are the anointed one, if you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Now, these guys, help me out, are they asking so that they can actually worship him freely? These guys were cowards. These guys were religious cowards, and they found time when there was a celebration list, when there's a large crowd gathering, to ask Jesus such questions because they wanted to turn the crowd against Jesus because they could manipulate the crowd. Now, I want you to be amazed at the wisdom and the tact that Jesus used in the way he answers them, okay? How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I told you, and you do not believe. Now, if that's your Bible, circle the word believe because the whole book of John is really going to be nailing in believe. And this morning, those of you who are believers, I want you to believe deeper. And if you're an unbeliever who claims to be a Christian, you just believe in Christianity, but you don't believe in Jesus. This morning, that's got to change. I told you and you don't believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. You see, why is it that they don't believe? Because they're dedicated to their religion. They're dedicated to their temple. They're dedicated to their rituals. They're dedicated to their self-respecting rabbis and Pharisees and Sadducees. They like that whole setup. It worked well for them. They didn't want to believe because Jesus' works was contradicting what they were dedicated to. Jesus will always contradict what you're celebrating. And he will ask you the question, what are you dedicated to? If you lack belief in Jesus because you're dedicated to something else. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. Jesus always pointed back to his works, man. In fact, even when uh, John the baptizer sends, he's in prison and he sends his disciples to Jesus and say, ask him, is he the Messiah or should we wait for someone else? Do you remember his answer? Luke chapter 7 verse 22. Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you have seen and what you have heard. The blind, they see. The lame, they hop, skipping and jumping. The lepers, they're cleansed. They're able to eat with their family again. The deaf, ta-da, they're able to hear. The dead, ha ha ha, they're raised to life. The poor have good news preached to them. You want to know if I'm the Messiah, if I'm the anointed one? I present to you exhibit A, my works. Why is Jesus not speaking plainly like they ask? Are you the Messiah? What's so wrong with him saying, yes, I'm the Messiah? In fact, this, this, this passage is what Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, and Muslims use to say, see, Jesus never answered plainly if he was the Messiah or not, if he was God or not. What they don't understand is the wisdom and the way Jesus is answering them. Because if Jesus says, yes, I'm the Messiah, you know what's going to happen? They're going to turn the crowd against him, saying, see, he said he's the Messiah. But what he's going to do is he's going to say, yes, I'm the Messiah, but not plainly, in, the, in their words, plainly, quote, unquote, say, yes, I'm the Messiah. In, in, instead, what he's going to do is he's very patiently trying to ask them the question, what are you dedicated to? Because if you're dedicated to the truth, if you really are dedicated in finding out who this Messiah is, you will see it. And this morning, church, 
who was watching me online, if you want to know the truth this morning, according to scripture, you're going to find out who Jesus truly is. And then the, the choice is going to be yours. What are you going to continue to be dedicated to? They wanted a political ruler. They didn't want a Messiah who was taking the good news to the poor. They wanted someone like Judah Maccabees to come and now overthrow the Romans. See how Jesus puts it. He says, you do not believe, verse 26, you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep, they hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. AKA, what he's saying is, you are not dedicated in being my sheep and you don't want me as your shepherd. Why is it that you don't believe? It's because you're not my sheep. Believers, I want to encourage you, okay? Uh -uh. What you believe, those who are not following the good shepherd will not understand. They will not understand why you celebrate what you celebrate, man. They don't understand the convictions and the consciousness that you have. Why? Because they're still dead in their trespasses. They're dead in their sins. Dead people don't understand stuff. Church, you need to learn to be patient with them. Beating those people up, throwing a bunch of verses mean nothing to them. In fact, you're only making them more bitter towards the truth. I want to encourage you. When you see people don't, not understanding why it's such a big deal to you, you rejoice that you have been born again. You rejoice that you have seen life in Jesus. You rejoice that God has given you a soft heart, a soft conviction, and a renewed spirit to have to respect those who are helpless and to value life. And then ask God to give you a broken heart for those who don't see it. Ask God to make you weep for the lost because they're going to hell. They're not among his sheep. Man, think about the people, man. Think about the 16, 17-year-old girls who are not among his sheep. Think about the depression that they're going to go through this year. It really bothers me because Jesus died even for them. Jesus loves even them. Hey, some of you, we were one of them when we were 16, 17. Why then, if we were shown grace, why don't we want to show grace to them? You know what? This is a judgment against them, but yet I see the grace in my Savior's voice. He says, you don't believe me because you're not my sheep. Oh, I wish you would believe me. Because you're celebrating something that God did for you, but yet I am the temple now. And this temple is going to be torn down, and yet you don't believe me. Church, do you know how much this is? If the world could hear this, if the world could hear the voice of the shepherd saying, you should be my sheep. There's where you find life. There's where you find meaning in your life. You know, there was one time when I was dead. I had no purpose in life. There was one time when I couldn't celebrate anything, man. I had to be high all the time because there was nothing that brought me joy until I became his sheep, until I found a shepherd who could guide me. Look at this. When you are dedicated to the shepherd, I know I'm in Idaho, and I know that we're very politically driven, and the church loves its politics. But to hell with politics, man. Yeah. I want to raise the name of Jesus up. He is the good shepherd. Yeah. Because politics will change. This country will change. The economy will change. But my Jesus will never change. And I don't care who comes in and who goes. But if you don't belong to the shepherd, you will not be able to celebrate anything in this world. Yeah. When you are dedicated to the shepherd, he turns around and he says, I'll be dedicated to you. No wonder we as believers go through our ups and downs based on what's happening in politics because you're not dedicated to him and you don't experience the dedication of the shepherd towards you. Look at the shepherd's dedication, man. In verse 28, it says, I will give them eternal life and they will... Never. Never. Raise your voices. They will... Never. No, one more time. They will... Never. Never perish. And no one can snatch them out of my hand. No matter who is in the office, you cannot be snatched. No matter what your bank account says, you cannot be snatched. No matter what the doctor says, you cannot be snatched. You will never perish. Now, that's kind of crazy because what do you mean you'll never perish, Joel? Uh, what, God, what do you mean you will never perish? 
Well, John chapter 3, verse 16, anyone who believes will never perish. In fact, next chapter, uh, I don't know where we're going to be, but I want to talk about a man named Lazarus who died, and Jesus raised him from life, from, from death to life, but that's not the life he's talking about because Lazarus died again. So I want to talk about what will never perish mean, but look at the promise of the shepherd's dedication to you, my friend. If you would be dedicated to him, he says, I will give you eternal life. And once again, man, I remember the time when I had no life. Yeah, I was breathing. I was very healthy because I was young. But I hated my existence. You know, I'll give you a little snippet of eternal life. When you finally understand that no matter what's happening in your world, that you have purpose, that you have intrinsic value, that you are loved, that you have a calling, that you are well-equipped with the Holy Ghost, that's a glimpse of eternal life. And if you have not experienced this joy that I'm talking about, you are not saved. You've not experienced eternal life. You have some Christianity, but you don't have eternal life. And it's because you're not dedicated to the shepherd and you've not experienced the shepherd's dedication towards you. I know the church doesn't talk a lot about calling. We think the calling is just for the pastors. The calling is just for the worship leaders. But each and every one of you, from the youngest to the oldest, you have a calling on your life. God, didn't, God is not a divine prankster who just made you as a divine joke. Sometimes I feel that way. But the shepherd's dedication to me is I will give them eternal life and nothing can snatch them out of my hand. The calling of God is irrevocable. In fact, it's not going to be up on the screen. It says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15, that Jesus delivers those who through fear of death was subject to lifelong slavery. I wish I could go Pentecostal and charismatic in here and say, let's have a breakthrough right now. But I know some of you are too white for that, but it's okay. <laughs> I know without a shadow of a doubt that there are many of you, you say that you're born again, you're blood-bought, Holy Ghost-filled, but you still fear death. You still live a lifelong slavery of fear. Fear is a very, very real thing. You're frightened about what's going to happen in the country. You're frightened about what's going to happen with the children. You're frightened about what's going to happen with the church. You're frightened about which pastor is going to do what and what's going to change and what's going to happen in the vaccines and the COVID and, and the next lie on social media and, and the people that are getting richer and the people that are getting poorer. And you are bogged down with fear, chained up with fear. The Bible says, and I love saying the Bible says because people told me years ago that that's irrelevant saying the Bible says. And so even more, I want to say it. The Bible says that is true, that's living, that's active, that's sharper than any two edged sword. The Bible says about my Jesus who's alive, that Jesus delivers all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. You were subject to lifelong slavery and fear, but my Jesus came to break that yoke of slavery. If you would be dedicated to the shepherd, his dedication to you is eternal life and nothing can snatch you out of his hand. It doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say, I'll give you eternal life. I'll also give you eternal protection. Amen. Verse 29. My father who has given them to me, that's the sheep, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. Now, earlier we saw that Jesus says, you're not my sheep. That's why you don't believe me. But here you see the invitation. You hard-hearted, cold, unbeliever. Look at the warm invitation of Jesus saying, if you would be dedicated to me, don't be dedicated to fighting your gender identity, man. Don't be dedicated to fighting about your pronouns and what people should call it. Don't be dedicated about fighting the laws and the rules and the regulation. All of that, if you want to do it, man, we'll figure that out. But first and foremost, be dedicated to me. I'm inviting you and I will give you eternal life. I'll give you purpose. I'll break you free from your chains of fear and death. I will give you an identity. Don't let downtown Boise give you identity. I will give you an identity. And then I will protect you eternally. Not just when you're a pastor, not just on Sunday mornings when you're in church, not just when you're being good, but I will eternally protect you because no one can snatch you out of the Father's hands. Can you imagine someone trying to steal from God? Some of you who are packing, you're like, I wish someone would come try to steal my house. Pew, 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 you know? <laughs> and imagine God. Try stealing from God. Now listen to me very carefully. Because of who Jesus is, because of his righteousness, because of his obedience, because of his brutal death on the cross, and because of him 
opening my eyes to my sin and me saying yes to him, I belong to him. I am his sheep. I am washed in his blood. My sins no longer hold me down. I do fail, but you know what? He has saved me from that shackles of lifelong slavery and I am now his child. And this is the beauty of this dedication that the shepherd has to me. Now he says, I'll protect you eternally and no one, no one can harm you because you are now in the father's hands. Joel, you're on the father's hands, man. So I can go to bed comfortable. I can go to bed not having to worry about what's going to happen next. I can go to bed not knowing what we're going to meet next week as a church because he is the author and the perfecter of my faith. Do you know the Bible says that for every person is given a measure of faith? You can't muster up faith. You can't jog around the block and say, here we go, I'm exercising my faith. You got to say, God, give me faith. The disciples say, give us this faith. Faith as big as a mustard seed, give it to me, Lord. And he protects you. He takes care of your protection. He takes care of your salvation. He takes care of keeping you saved. You see, if you had to be righteous for you to be saved, then you could easily lose that salvation. You are saved not because of your righteousness. Oh my gosh, you know, I want to have a time of worship just because of that. You're saved not because of your good works, man. You're saved not because you did something right at one point. You're saved because Jesus, my beautiful Savior, died on that cross for you and me. And now the warm invitation cable says, you come to me, you be dedicated to me, and I'll be dedicated to you. And you said, okay, fine. (laughs) What have I got to lose? And then you had everything to gain. It gets better. Not only does he dedicate eternal life to you, not only does he dedicate protection, eternal protection, he also makes you a part of his eternal plan. (laughs) Oh, Lord, this is amazing. Because it's nice to be included, isn't it? Yeah, Yeah, those of you who've been left out a lot, it's nice to be included. And people might not include you in this world, but the dedication that God has for you when you become a sheep, you become a part of his eternal plan. It says that, Look at that verse. The Father who has given them to me is greater than all. The Father has given them to me. That is, the Father says, hey, listen, this guy, Joel, I'm giving him to you. Now he's going to be washing your blood. He's going to be cleansed. And then Jesus, in John chapter 17, look at his prayer. He says in verse 11, I am no longer in the world as Jesus praying to the Father. I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm coming to you Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Okay, okay, okay. So so, so I know know it's getting a little too complicated, okay? The way you become a part of God's eternal plan is you are now a part of the plan of salvation. You're now a part of his plan of sanctification, being made holy. You are a part of his plan of justification, Okay, which is one day you will stand before him and God's going to look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You're a part of his plan. And then you're a part of his plan in the final consummation of the bride and the groom in the beautiful supper of the lamb. You become a part of his plan because you say, I'll be dedicated to my shepherd. More than anything else in this world, I'm dedicated to my shepherd. I want to be his sheep. And he promises that he'll be dedicated to you by giving you eternal life, protecting your eternal life, and then making you a part of his eternal plan. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe we do need 15 people on stage to get you all hyped up. <laughs> and then Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Don't forget, don't forget, the question was, tell us plainly, are you the Messiah? And Jesus, wow, that's a home run statement right there. I and the Father are one. Jesus multiple times had told them very plainly who he was. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the bread of life. I am the door. He made these statements making very clear connection to who he was, that he was not just the Messiah, but he was God. I and the Father are one. What he's saying over there is not just the Father and I have the same plan. The Father and I are one in vision. What he's saying is the Father and I are one in essence. We're one in being. And I'm not going to get into that too much because I preached a whole sermon on that called The Godhead. It's under our FAQ series. I was talking about the triune God. So you can go home and listen to that if you have any questions about 
the Trinity and how does three in one, how does that work? Um, it's, a, it's a great message. But instead of Jesus answering them plainly, quote unquote, Jesus points out that their dedication is not towards finding out the truth about who is God and how can I worship him in spirit and in truth. And he gives them an answer that's very clear but not plain. It's very clear but not plain in the way they wanted it. And look at what their response is. In John chapter 10, verse 31, they picked up stones again to stone him. Earlier in John chapter 5, they wanted to stone him because he was making himself equal with God. And once again, they're looking to stone him because this was blasphemy. A man claiming to be God was blasphemy and had to be stoned. And so they pick up stones to stone him. This should break your heart, man. And it should make you wonder how many times have we picked up stones and rejected something that God began to do because you were dedicated to something else other than the truth. You were dedicated to politics and policies and theologies and doctrines and denominations and not to Jesus, not to the good shepherd. How many times were misled by thieves and robbers because we're not dedicated to the shepherd? And they picked up stones. Can you imagine that, man? These were the religious leaders of Israel and they were kicking God incarnate out. They said, you, okay, look at this, verse 32. Jesus answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? <laughs> Beautiful question. They answered him, it's not for your good works that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. Once again, Jesus didn't make himself God. He was fully God who had made himself man. J.R. Packer says it, being all that he was, he became what he was not. Taking the form of a servant, humbling himself, to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, he's been given a name that's above every name, that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if he's Lord, you have to be dedicated towards him. You have to be dedicated first and foremost to him. No matter what your interests are, no matter what your pursuits are, our first and foremost dedication should be to Jesus. And the invitation came to them, they rejected it. I hope you and me this morning will not reject this too quickly. But let it weigh on your spirit. Ask yourself, man, am I dedicated to my shepherd? Are there other things that I celebrate too quickly? And because I idolize a denomination, do I demonize people who don't think the way I do? And am I bringing division among the sheep that are his? And am I beating them and harming them and turning myself against God? Am I becoming the blasphemer while I call the sheep of God people who are wrong illiterate, ignorant, sinful, and who have no hope. Jesus interrupts celebration. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus interrupts celebration and he challenges them in the dedication. But you see, you cannot be dedicated to something if you don't realize how important it is. Right? Yeah. If it's not important, you're not going to be dedicated. You see, I, when I was in India, I didn't want to become an American citizen. Because I did not know how beautiful this country was. I did not know how amazing the freedoms that we have are. The freedom to speak. The freedom to get up and preach. The freedom to be who God called me to be. It's such a, I'm telling you, man, this is a country that's been blessed by God. And I'm very, very, very grateful for, um, for this country. I'm not talking down to my home country. I've learned a lot of good things. And I really wish that they would hold fast to what God has begun in that country and not try to become like the West. But this country has its blessings. But you will not appreciate it. You would not be dedicated to what God is doing in this country if you first don't see, okay, what God has done and how amazing the blessing is to be in this country. I'll give you an example, okay. Um, when, when I got into ministry, uh, my first car after getting into ministry was, uh, it, it could be on a TV show, like a comedy TV show, like, you know, one of those prank cars on Top Gear or something like that. Um, I called it Red Bull because it was red and it was beat up, man. It was an old, old, old car. It was a three-cylinder, um, four-speed on the floor. Uh, I'm not joking. It had no brakes, like literally no brakes. I just had to downshift to slow it down and then hope it stopped before I hit the buffalo on the street. Uh, um, the headlights, I could use it, but then my battery would die real quick because the stator was bad, my battery was bad. The seats were all ripped up. The seats would rock all the time. 
and um, the suspensions was non-existent. <laughs> and oftentimes the car was so light and oftentimes the battery would be dead, so I'd had to stick it in neutral and push the car and then jump in the driver's seat and pop the clutch <laughs> and then drive. The first car I owned when I, was, I had a good job um, was a beautiful car. You know, it was amazing, man. It was, that was my very first car that I owned, but the first car I owned after getting into ministry was this really beat up car. But I didn't miss my first car at all. I really didn't care much about my first car that I had. I liked the second car a lot because my mother's here. There was one Sunday we were driving um, to church. We were riding to church on my motorcycle. My mom was in the back, and I had to go lead worship. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's India, man. <clears throat> Did I tell you we had five goats hanging in the front, too, and chickens? No. <laughs> and, and oftentimes when I, when I go to churches to lead worship, um, I had to carry my guitar. And, and in India, you have a season called monsoon that rains. And I hated it when my guitar got wet in the rain. When musicians are like, you yeah. know, uh, it was a borrowed guitar too. It wasn't my own. And, um, and it was kind of horrible to, to drive and go dripping wet and have to lead worship. And so I prayed for a car and, and it was nice to have this car. And so I really valued it because I saw what it was like to not have it, to jump in a bus and, you know, be worried about your guitar getting broken when it's crowded. You know, Indian buses, how they are. The population is crazy. Or trying to ride my motorcycle in the rain with the guitar strapped to my back. Bad idea. And so it was nice to have this little Flintstones car. You will never appreciate what you have if you don't understand the blessing that comes along with it. Okay? Oftentimes, and I've said this for years now, blessing without character is a curse. And a lot of people look at this country, they look at Christianity, and it seems like a curse to them because they lack the character to appreciate the blessing. Now, I say all this to say that oftentimes people look at Jesus as a curse because they don't recognize the blessing that he is because they lack the character to see the blessing that he is. Number two, recognizing Jesus' consecration, his anointing. Man, Jesus is a blessing. Do you know that? Oh. Jesus is the best blessing you can ever, ever, ever receive in all of eternity. And if you want to grow in dedication to this good shepherd, you have to recognize his consecration. Consecration is a word for um, anointing, for being set apart. The Greek word over there is, um, I think it's hagios, or hagitso. Uh, the Hebrew <clears throat> talks about being set apart. Kodesh, kodosh, is unlike anything else. The priests were set apart for a duty. The Levites were set apart. The utensils used in the temple was kodosh. It was set apart. It was hagitso. And Jesus is unlike any other. He was consecrated for a very unique task. Believers, I know you've heard this every Christmas. You've heard this every Resurrection Sunday. But please, let the Holy Ghost bring it to you in a very new way, in a profound way this morning. Jesus was consecrated for a certain task. And if we don't appreciate his consecration, you will not grow in your dedication. So, they are picking up stones to stone him because he's making himself one with God. And Jesus is interrupting the celebration. The celebration is interrupted with getting ready for a stoning, such a weird thing, and Jesus' answer to them now, they're getting ready to stone them, to stone him. Jesus answered them, verse 34, is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? Jesus quoting Psalm 82, verse six. No, don't be impressed by that, it's in your footnotes. You're like, wow, this pastor knows all the cross references. No, no, it's right there in your footnotes. <laughs> Psalm 82, six, this is what it says. Psalm 82, 6, I said you are gods, small g gods, still the same word Elohim in Hebrew, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Here David in the book of Psalms is quoting the giving of the law on Mount Sinai to those that received the law of God. Please track with me over here. We're having church, okay? So this is good for you. So Jesus is responding to these guys who have stones in their hand, getting ready to stone Jesus because he's claiming to be God. And Jesus' response is saying, listen, you want to stone me? But David said, in Psalm 82, verse 6, I said you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. If he called them gods, back to um, John chapter 10, verse 35, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, again, the word of God came. The rabbi's teaching was this, okay? Now, three things I want you to keep in mind in this real quick thing. I want to try and explain this well. Jesus is quoting scripture. Scripture cannot be broken, it's true. The rabbis had an explanation of Scripture. Jesus is using Scripture and the interpretation of Scripture against them. 
Okay? So he's saying, now, now, now David writes that the Most High God called those who received the word gods. And I'm saying that, you know, the Father and I are one. And you're saying that I'm making myself God. So if David could use God for those who received the word of God, why then are you wanting to stone me? Okay? Now, the rabbis taught that the people that received the law from God, that God was inviting the people of Israel to live like gods. Mormons, again, get this confused over here. That God was inviting these people to keep the law of God and to live like gods. That's why it says in Psalm chapter 82, verse 30, uh, verse 7. Psalms 82, verse 7. Nevertheless, like men you shall die and fall like any prince. So God says, you are God's sons of the Most High, all of you. But nevertheless, like men you shall die and fall like any other prince. So the rabbis interpreted this as God gave them the law to live as gods. But because they didn't keep the law, they built that you know, golden calf. So God said, you will die like every other prince. You will die. That's the rabbi's interpretation. I'm not going to preach from the book of Psalms this morning. But Jesus using the interpretation in scripture against them now to say, so if they could call themselves gods, why can't I? And look at this, how he continues. <clears throat> he says, if scripture cannot be broken, verse 36, do you say of him whom the father consecrated, anointed, set apart, and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I'm the son of God? Wow. Once again, you see what he's doing. He's saying, first he's confronting the dedication, and now he's saying, listen, you don't recognize that I'm consecrated by the Father. I'm anointed and set apart by the Father for this very task. And if you don't recognize my consecration, if you don't recognize my messiahship, if you don't recognize that I'm set apart, sent away to be the Passover lamb, of course you, don't want, you wouldn't want to be dedicated to following my leadership. And how many times there are people who call themselves Christians but don't recognize Jesus as the messiah? Don't recognize Jesus as the Savior who took the place of sin and death. Churches don't want to talk about the death because they're like, it's too gruesome. Jesus was set apart, anointed to be the Passover lamb. Jesus says in verse 37, I am not doing the works of my, if, if I'm not doing the works of my father, then do not believe me. Once again, the proof of his consecration was his works. I'm doing the works of my father, man. If I'm not doing the works of my father, then don't believe me. Once again, coming back to belief, he wants them to believe. What a beautiful savior. He says, come on, you need to be dedicated to me, but you won't be dedicated to me if you don't recognize my consecration. Recognize my consecration by looking at my works that I'm doing. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I am in the father. You remember? Jesus, in the book of Luke, chapter 4, verse 18, it's not going to be up on the screen. He opened the scroll to Isaiah 61. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Because he's anointed me. He's consecrated me. He set me apart to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set free those who are oppressed. And did, didn't Jesus do that? Yeah. Yeah. But people didn't recognize his consecration. Peter, when he's preaching in Cornelius' house in Acts 10, he says, you know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Ghost and with power. And he fulfilled Isaiah 61, set captives free. But even though they saw the works of the Father done through Jesus, they didn't recognize his consecration. Church, sometimes I'm frightened that we recognize good programs. We recognize good buildings. We recognize good chairs that are comfortable. We recognize good worship leaders, good instruments. We recognize good microphones. We recognize good lighting and cameras. But do we recognize the consecration of Jesus? Do we recognize that he is the Messiah that was sent into the world to take our place of sin? Because if we don't recognize him with a deep-rooted joy and conviction and intimacy, you will never have dedication to follow the good shepherd. Verse 39, again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. Instead of celebrating the true Messiah, the true temple, the true meeting place of God and man, they wanted to tear him down. Church, my dear friends, believers, unbelievers, those of you who have a desperate desire to grow in intimacy with Jesus, would you please take an inventory of your life and ask yourself, even though you've been a believer for 20, 30 years, what are you dedicated to? What are you pursuing? And in those pursuits, do you see the consecration of Jesus? Do you see that dedication coming because of your love for Jesus? Do you see your dedication coming because you want to elevate the beautiful sacrifice of the Passover lamb, the anointed one? 
finally celebrating your salvation. And this is going to go quick. Don't worry. You guys awake? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, if you're tired, man, I got a whole different second service to preach, okay? I want to, I really want to um, just kind of make the statement. And I think, I, th I think it's a true statement because I, I've been chewing on it, but I don't think anybody's ever said this. You cannot celebrate anything until you've been saved. There's nothing that you can celebrate until you've been saved. There are people would say, whoa, 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 hey man, I'm not saved and I go to Mardi Gras and I get drunk. Exactly. You're running away from true joy. And what you have is counterfeit joy. The Bible does say that sin will give you pleasure for a time being. But then it shows its vicious, venomous fangs and it kills you. You could say, well, I've been an unbeliever all my life and I had some amazing birthday parties. Okay, I've been there too. I don't know about you, man, but if I'm a human being like you and I'm not an alien, I remember those birthdays feeling a deep sense of despair, wondering why in the world am I still here and I hated my life. I was so needy for attention. I was so needy for friendship. I was so needy for gifts to make myself feel better. The true celebration I can tell you this true celebration came. I remember very clearly. I remember what I was wearing. It was a pink t-shirt. It wasn't very manly back then. Ripped jeans, Levi's, bell bottoms. And the worship leader was singing, My Jesus, my Savior. Lord, there's none like you. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your powerful name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I will love you, and forever I will stand. Nothing compares to the promise that I have in you. I remember the joy that came when the Holy Ghost empowered me that very minute to forgive my dad who had hurt me. The Holy Ghost gave me courage to turn around and to look at everybody that had intimidated me because they were more talented and to say, I know I have a place in this kingdom. That very day, I remember the chains falling away from me that had shackled me in fear. I remember that very day knowing that God had a plan for me. I, I, I still had my insecurities. I still felt very ugly and my breath still smelled bad, man. I did not know what it was when you're a teenager, man. You just smell. Okay, I'm sorry. When you're going through puberty, it's bad. But something happened that day. But I finally was able to celebrate. And every time I went into the world to celebrate like I used to, you know what? It got, it got me depressed. It, it wasn't, it wasn't, I, Billy was listening to me. It wasn't guilty. When I sinned, when I fell, it wasn't guilt. It wasn't condemnation. It was a joyful conviction. It was saying, why do I want McDonald's cheeseburgers when I can have filet mignon, man? Yeah. Why do I want to eat this vomit when I have a place at the Father's table? I told my wife this this week. I said, I think I could preach the prodigal son for the rest of my life every single Sunday. You see, I asked myself, why did I make the pig pen my permanent residence when my father is still waiting for me. There's where true celebration is. True celebration was not when he went and got drunk and slept around with prostitutes. No, true celebration came when the father came running. He was dedicated to the shepherd. The shepherd said, I'll be dedicated to you. I will run towards you, man. I'll give you a colorful robe. It's waiting for you. Ring, identity, shoes, dignity. And you know what? There's a fattened calf. Oh, I think the calf was the only one that was sad for that day. But praise God, we don't have a fattened calf waiting to be killed. It's sad. We have a shepherd who became the lamb who took your place in mine. I want to talk about celebrating your salvation. If you're a believer, you cannot let any ounce of hell invade your life. Believers, I know you're tired right now. Believers, I know you're confused right now, but we dare not let the enemy get a foothold in your life. You dare not let the enemy use you to divide the world even more. No, we're supposed to be peacemakers in this world. And the only way we can win this war is when we learn to celebrate our salvation, man. I love that the mission for our church is that our intimacy with Jesus will compel unbelievers to find new life and hope in Jesus. How are people going to find this compelling love if you're so hateful? If you don't learn to celebrate your salvation, man, nobody's going to be saved. 
Charles Spurgeon, one of the preachers I look up to, he says, I want to burn for Jesus, that people will at least come and watch me burn. And I had to add to it and said, I don't want people just to come and watch me burn. I want them to start questioning, why am I not burning? I want to burn too. One of the reasons why I don't like having programs in the church is because you don't need a program in the church. You are the program. You have a mission field over there. You have a calling over there. You have an anointing over there that God's given you to go cause this world to blaze on fire for Jesus. But that would not happen if you don't celebrate your salvation. And a question that I get asked almost every single week is, how can I be saved? (laughs) I love that question. More than... You know, how do I get rich? How do I lead? What is success? To hell with all of that. How can I be saved? There are various different ways. The Bible illustrates salvation, but it's all one and the same. And I want to use these few verses and see how salvation comes. Are you ready? Verse 40 says, Jesus went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first and he remained there. Pause real quick. It can seem like There was a glimmer of hope, and now God cannot be found. He's gone. Anybody walking through the shoes of Job right now, you could say, I do not know where God is. It seems like hope is lost. Courage is lost. Calling is lost. Church building is lost. My strength is lost. My black hair is lost. Our blonde hair is lost. I only have gray hair now. My hair is lost. I have bald spots. Everything is gone. It feels like all the things that once was a blessing is gone. But you still have access to salvation. Look at this. Jesus is gone at a distance, and many, and I pray this morning that many came to him, that many will come to him. How are you saved? It's simple. Come to Jesus. It doesn't get more simple than that. Just come to Jesus, man. Come as you are. Just come to Jesus. You know what I love about this? If you've been paying attention, I told you how brutal It was when this evil, wicked guy came and tortured babies, tortured mothers, desecrated the temple, and they're celebrating this beautiful festival, and here are people who left the temple, and they came and they found Jesus. They left what they were dedicated to. They left the feast of dedication, and they're coming to Jesus. And I hope this morning you're willing to leave all the things that you're dedicated to and come to Jesus. How can you be saved? Leave the world. Leave your love. Leave what you're so obsessed with and come to Jesus this morning. How can I be saved? Please come to Jesus. But coming to church doesn't save you. Sitting and listening to a sermon doesn't save you. Going to a conference doesn't save you. Turning on the live stream at Living Church Boise does not save you. They came and they said that John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. Hey, there's a recap of my sermon. They're coming. It shows dedication. They're recognizing his, what's number two? Consecration. Everything John said about him was true. What did John say? You remember? Behold, the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Everything that John said is true. Salvation is happening. Do you see the birthing over here? Hey, we're we're, we're midwives over here. We're watching new birth happen right before our very eyes in John chapter 10. This is amazing. You guys are amazed at this, man. This is beautiful. First, they leave what they're dedicated to. They're leaving the world. They find Jesus and they're recognizing his consecration, his anointing. But it's not just coming out of the world. It's not just recognizing, but something else has to happen. And it says, and many believed in him there. I want you to have the guts this morning to come out of Babylon. Put away the chains. Put away the fear of failure. Put away the world. Politics is secondary. You know, older generation, I love you. You worked really hard at this country. You worked really hard at churches. You worked really hard at keeping the value of freedom in this country. And I really respect you for that. Thank you for that. And I really hope that my generation will do a good job of raising our kids to value the respect and the awe and reverence in this country. But one day you're going to die. And you never know what's going to happen. We're not ushered eternal security for our country, but we're ushered eternal eternal security for our salvation. Nothing can snatch you out of his hand. Come out from worshiping the country and politics, and laws, and rules, and regulations, and neighborhoods, and be dedicated to Jesus. Recognize this anointing, and then 
believe in him. What does it mean to believe? It means to fully recline on him, not on your works, not on your religiosity, but believe in him. Believe that he is the lamb that was slain for you. I pray that this morning that many of you who are born again will grow deeper in intimacy with Jesus. And those of you who are not born again, that this morning will be the last that you'll be confused about your salvation, but you'll know for certain that you've renounced everything you were dedicated to and you're consecrating yourself to Jesus, putting all your faith in him. Would you please stand? We'll pray and we'll close. My father, you're a good God. I thank you that even the times when we've let you down, I have let you down, God. I walked away from you. I rejected you. I didn't trust you. I didn't believe you. You have been faithful to me. God, I thank you that you didn't send Judah Maccabees to come and protect me, but you sent your son, Jesus, the Messiah, to break the chain of fear, to break the cycle of death. And you've given us new life, abundant life, eternal life, life that's protected by you that no one can take. So, Father, I pray that no matter what we celebrate this week and as we get ready to celebrate this beautiful country, that our celebration will come from a place of rejoicing in our salvation. We will rejoice at what you blessed us with. And for the things we don't have, we'll trust you, Lord. And when things start going south, we will trust you because your word already tells us that it's got to get worse. Yes. And prepare us, O oh Lord, for your return. Yes. Just help us to be prepared for your return because you're coming soon. You are coming soon, Bo Yeshua. Come quickly, Lord. Come quickly, Lord. And give us the strength to withstand the temptation to rely on our righteousness, the temptation to make it about our works, the temptation to start getting dedicated with everything else and not be dedicated to you. Gentle shepherd, please lead us. I thank you for this beautiful country that still is a billboard for the world. And would you please, God, use this church to confront to confront the false Christianity that's being churned and plastered all around the world. Please, God, let your gospel reach many who are lost. Let this good news of your invitation reach many who are hurting right now. Please, God, we know that you love them. You died for them. You created them. You know them so well. So whoever, those person, whoever that person is, O oh Lord, bring them into the fold this morning. And for believers in this place, O oh Lord, create in us a clean heart. And please renew a right spirit within us. We once again consecrate ourselves to you. God, sever any ties to the world and bind our hearts to yours. Help us, O Lord, to cry for the lost and to stir those who are found to be your hands and feet, to be a billboard of your beautiful grace. Teach us, O Lord, in so many different ways to be able to share the gospel the good news of who you are to a lost and a dying and a depressed world. God, I pray for revival, O oh Lord, in this country. I pray for revival in this neighborhood, revival in this valley, that we truly will be able to celebrate freedom that comes from our salvation. And now, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father and the power of the Holy Ghost, bring you freedom and abundant joy as promised in the scriptures, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, for that is the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.